Um, so Scott, <laughs> the bio he just wrote for us very graciously, uh, grew up in the wild of Northern California and worked for the Forest Service uh, for nine years as a wildland firefighter. Uh, became a high school teacher in 2013 and taught yearbook and economics. Um, he was sick of being inside all day, so he went uh, to work in a cave for the Park Service for two summers. And in 2016, went to work as a seasonal employee with the Springfield Armory. While there, um, he was able to trick them into giving him a permanent job and <laughs> combine his passion for firearms history and education. So please welcome Scott Galson. Thank you, Danny. Wow, oh, you have to lower lower this thing a little bit. Here we go. <laughs> okay, hello everybody. Thanks for thanks for having me today. Uh, so, what uh, what we'll be doing is I'll be talking about uh, kind of my my journey through working with and, and trying to find and, and use three D printers and scanners uh, from a museum education standpoint. And so, what and then kind of similar to the last presentation after this. What, what I'd really like to do is open it up uh, to, the, to our audience here and see what everybody else is, is doing, if they're interacting with this technology in any way. And I've, uh, I've created some, some sort of things to think about, too, or even discussion points that I would, I would like to bring up at the end of this and see just kind of where we're all at. But first, okay, a little bit, a little bit more about me and what I, what I do now. Uh, so I work for the National Park Service. I'm the education specialist for uh, Springfield Armory, National Historic Site. And Springfield Armory essentially interprets the history of uh, a firearms manufacturing and design facility that was run by the, the US government for about 174 years. And so there's different ways that we do that. Um, one is, is through, through the objects. We have a, a curatorial department. He's here. <laughs> the curatorial department. And, uh, and so we also, the other aspect of that is interpretation, what's called interpretation and education. And so interpretation uh, primarily works with the, the public, right? The people that are coming to the, to the museum or the people looking at our website or on, that we interact with on Facebook or other uh, sort of digital platforms. The education aspect of it is what I uh, concentrate on. So I, I work with both, but my, my position is to interact with uh, school groups um, and that's really K through K through college uh, we have we have some different levels I came into this uh, particular job about two and a half years ago and um, what what's happened is that the Park Service has, a, has essentially a mandate right to work with students uh, they've, they've actually identified fourth grade as, as the primary uh, grade that they want to cover but we have a pretty wide area of discretion to create educational programming for whatever whatever grade level we, we really want to. And I found that, just on the side note, fourth grade is it's kind of a tough one to get a little more, a little deeper into the history of firearms use and manufacturing. So uh, I've been concentrating mainly on, mainly on like high school and middle school. Uh, but what one thing I wanted to do was I said, okay, how can we mix this up a little bit? And part of what happens um, kind of at the end of the fiscal year is sometimes if we have money that didn't get didn't get spent um, we have uh, we have a little bit maybe a little more in my budget than I would normally have and so they say okay what do you do you have anything that you particularly want to get and so two years ago I, I was looking around and I said I want a 3d printer and then they said oh what's, how much does that cost and I, I told them and they said yeah no that's not that's probably not gonna happen uh, so, so I thought about it, I said, okay, fine. So I got some, some Sharpies instead. And, <laughs> and so what, uh, what happened is I had, a, you know, I had a year and I kind of thought about it and I said, well, I actually, because this was spur of the moment, and I said, I think that might actually be kind of cool. Maybe I should kind of come up with some reasons why I want a 3D printer. And so I, I, I thought about it a little bit so that I was a little more prepared for the next time around. And so... One of, the, one of the things that I was thinking is, okay, STEAM, right? Anyone heard of what this concept, STEAM, in the education realm? Any hands? A couple, couple folks. So essentially what, what that is, is this is getting a lot of traction in the, in the U.S. And so it stands for science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. And so these are, are groups of, of uh, sort of educational concepts that schools are trying to push 
more of, essentially. Um, it's been kind of going into a lot of, a lot of uh, lots of testing and, and some things are kind of getting pushed to the wayside and they, they really want to, want to get this stuff going. And so what I looked at and I said, okay, this is kind of a trend, right? There's money coming into this. There's schools that are saying, we want this like STEM and STEAM education to start happening at these schools and we want to have these dynamic uh, interactive programs where kids are actually like creating things and getting hands on and, and working with them. And uh, what I realized is I was looking at what we've been doing and while, while still very good, um, it's pr focused primarily on uh, social studies. Right? And so I said, okay, I, maybe I can expand our, our reach with some of these schools and get, uh, maybe get teachers that didn't historically think that they had any reason to interact with Springfield Armory because they're, you know, I'm not a history teacher. So why, why would I work with a museum? So well, it's a museum about innovation and technology. So I thought this would be very, kind of an appropriate idea. The other thing, uh, the, the physical aspect of it is you can, you can build things with a 3D printer, right? So I decided that if we could create objects for, three, for education programs, we could use this 3D printer essentially as a tool, right? Maybe not the kids using it themselves, but if we have uh, something we want to build, we can do that. So one example of that is one of our uh, volunteers wants to have a cartridge rolling program. And not always the easiest thing to do is to cast up a couple hundred mini balls out of, out of lead there. And so it's also heavy. And also, if you're working with kids, you're giving them lead. And you say, please, please don't eat this. And uh, <laughs> it can be problematic. So we're, we're working on actually printing up uh, 3D printed mini balls. So sometimes. Mm, somewhat cheaper, uh, maybe in the long run, I haven't done the math on that, depending on how, much, how many we print out, but uh, something that we can do, right? We can use this object to create educational programming tools, and so that's the other thing I was thinking of. Um, kinesthetic learning, right? The concept of hands-on. How can you, how can you, you can look at things, you can read about them, but it works a lot better if we can get the kids to touch this stuff. And we do have, in, in the interpretation division, we have education firearms, right? So they're not in the museum collection. They are uh, the interpretation divisions so that people can actually physically handle them, but they're still, and they've been, they've been rendered you know, in, in, incapable of firing in some manner, but it's still a, a, an object that you have to have essentially physical control of, even when the, the people or the public is handling it. And so I was trying to think, well, could we create things that people could handle and we didn't have to be like right there hovering on them. We could give like five or six or ten of these different things to a, to a school group or a public uh, gathering and they could, they could actually interact with this thing a little more, a little more personally uh, instead, of, instead of with us having to maintain control of it all the time. Another thing that we were thinking about, and I, uh, Alex and I talked about for a while using animations, right, as a, as a museum floor interpretive aid. And so, and now I realize I know an animator, which is, which is pretty cool. Uh, this was, this was a, a while ago, prior to that, and we were looking at, you know, what, uh, where do you find animation? So, I mean, you know, obviously YouTube uh, found on, uh, as an app, this World of Guns app, which is pretty interesting, and that, that's kind of a three-dimensional look at different firearms and how they work. And I thought, well, hey, if we, if we maybe we could get a scanner too, and scan these things. In all honesty, I, I didn't quite know how it would, it would actually end up with the end result, right? You scan it, and then what? I don't know, you turn it into an animation? Can't be that hard, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, so, so it's probably, it was a little more difficult than I, than I realized, but, um, but it was an idea. And then from that, what I jumped to is, so we, firearms uh, in, in museums are sometimes, they're sitting there, right, and they're fairly static. So you can look at it and you can, you can have a description maybe of how it works, but if you don't really understand uh, the terminology and the components and you're not, you're not really into it, if you look at it and you say, like, I don't, that's neat, but I don't know how that works, right? Like, what is, what's the point? Um, and so what I thought also is, hey, if we could actually scan some of our objects and create exhibits that show the internal mechanisms of these things. And maybe people, and as we saw, oh, I saw this yesterday in the museum, uh, a little more, more hands-on, 
Uh, but then people could manipulate the object and they could actually see how some of these more complex internal functions actually actually work, right? which, would be, which would be pretty neat. And then uh, a really great education tool as well. So I was thinking if, uh, if we have this on the museum floor, this is something that I can use as a tool for putting school groups in and getting them to think not so much about firearms, right? Because it can be kind of problematic. I can't just go and say, hey kids, uh, let's design machine guns today. Um, that's, that's not necessarily what we're, what we're looking for. So I'm looking more at um, innovation and invention and technology and how do, we, how do we harness what was happening at the armory and turn that into something that we can, we can teach kids about and get them to be, uh, be inventive and, and understand kind of this concept. And if we've got more of these three these objects where they can actually see the internal workings of these things, we can uh, we can translate the firearm idea into the general idea of, uh, of mechanics and, and engineering, which which was pretty exciting when I started thinking about it. So those are those are some of the things that I thought. Okay, how how can we use this? Like, how can I actually like show my boss? Hey, this is what we this is what we need. And so the uh, getting to the nitty gritty, right? I finally, uh, last year, we got approval. I said I had, my, I had my proposal, and I said this is why I need a 3D printer. Right? This is why the museum needs a 3D printer. Uh, I think we can do these really great things with this. And they, they okayed it, and they said, okay, let's, let's do this. So moving, moving forward, right? And then, and then I realized, whoa, there's a lot of 3D printers out there. So what, what do I need? Uh, <laughs> and I hadn't, in all honesty, I hadn't really done a ton of research on it prior to that because I didn't think that we would get uh, funding for it. And <laughs> so, so they said, all right, well, you've got a week uh, and let us know what you want. And so I, I, got, I got on it and I got on the computer and I started looking and I realized, well, there is, there is a lot of, uh, of different 3D printers out there. And, and so I started thinking to myself, what are some of the things that I actually need, right? Instead of, instead of just getting overwhelmed, I said, I need a couple of different things. And so I, I came up with some parameters. And one of the, the essentially four parameters that I was looking for, um, one was I wanted to be, as, as much as I could, made in the USA, or at the very least assembled in the USA. And part of that is because you know we're spending federal funds, and, uh, and I wanted to go back, back, back into, uh, into the, the US, right? I thought that was, that was appropriate. We didn't have to be like very compliant. But I, I would like to do that as much as I possibly can. Uh, I also wanted to be pre-assembled because chances are I was not going to easily be putting this thing together. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I probably should admit it in here. I'm not. I'm not as mechanically inclined all the time. And so I thought, all right, I don't want to have to deal with this, right? I don't have the time. I've got so. I've got all this other stuff I want to do. I need to do. Uh, I, I can't. I can't be putting this thing together. Uh, right for hours and hours and days even. So I said I want it pre-assembled. The other thing I wanted was customer support. I'm not a, I'm not a programmer. I needed I needed something that if I didn't understand how it worked, I needed to be able to call somebody up and they could run me through it and explain it. Because if you're going to spend a decent amount of money on this on this thing and you're going to actually want to have it working, uh, I want I want to be able to get help when I need it. So I was looking for some. What has good customer support or can we purchase? extra customer support. The other thing is I needed it easily transportable because we have, we have a, a space that we use for education programs in the basement, but it's used for everything, right? So if, if people have meetings at the armory, uh, if we have, uh, if Alex does a presentation, uh, this, this is the same space that's used down there. So I can't, I can't just have this thing sitting uh, in the basement classroom, right? I have to move it around. And so I wanted it so that I didn't have to Try to pick it up each time, and uh, and I didn't want to have to like try to get our uh, maintenance guy to make me a cart, you know. So then I said, "What's what's pre-made?" And so what I ended up coming up with was actually this one that's pictured right here. So the Fusion Fusion Three, right? I want to do a big plug for it because uh, that's probably not not appropriate. But this is what I ended up with. So it does have it's assembled in the United States. It had U.S.-based customer support. It came with uh, with its own cart. It was, it was pretty much plug and play, right? So it's uh, as much as it, I felt it could be for a 3D printer. I didn't have to uh, put anything together. Really, I just had to put the plastic roll into it, which I was, I was capable of doing after, after reading the directions. So it was, it was pretty easy. And, uh, and so then, though, so okay, we have this printer. Uh, 
that's neat, but like, what do I print, right? And how do I print? I had, I had three preloaded uh, test runs, right, that they said, okay, print these out. So I printed myself a business card holder and uh, some kind of little uh, oddball toy. And then I said, all right, well, I can't just print these over and over and over again, right? So how do you actually how do you feed this stuff into this thing? And so I was looking, and there's a couple different, couple different ways that you do that. So one is you can find pre-made, ready-to-print designs online. Is anyone, anyone familiar? Anyone looked around and, and found that? Okay, so a couple of you, right? Yeah. So a couple of the ones that I looked at. There's a plate of Thingverse, uh, Sketchfab, GrabCAD. These are just three of dozens of these websites. That and there's no particular order. That's just kind of what I what I found. But they actually have people that are creating hundreds of different uh, themes, right? And thousands and thousands of different objects that are already created digitally for you to be able to print out. And uh, some of them are, are are pretty well done, right? Some of them are done in some pretty some pretty intense CAD programs that are they're professional grade, and people take a lot of time and energy in doing this. And some of them are. Uh, they're a little more slipshod, but it just depends on what you're looking for. The thing that I was uh, I looked around at that I had a hard time figuring out is there's not a there's not a lot of stuff about making firearm parts in there, um, and this is where we kind of start getting a little um, into some gray areas as well. But there's lots of video game guns. That's that's not something that I was I was totally looking for. Uh, there's some modern firearms which I felt that. I wasn't entirely comfortable with. Uh, and then there was a very limited amount of historic firearms, right? So the one that I have right here is, uh, was anyone recognize that? What? It's a flintlock. Uh, <laughs> and so that's a, that's a 3D printed flintlock mechanism right there. So that one is actually fine. I read through that and this guy, this guy did his homework and actually did, did his measurements. And, and, uh, and so I, I ended up, I ended up, well, I'll kind of, We'll see it in a later slide, but that's one that I ended up using. Uh, but I thought that was neat, but you're limited by that, by what someone else has already created for you, right? Be that, be that good, high quality or low quality. So you're not always gonna find exactly what you want, right? Maybe you have a great idea um, about how you wanna use this in some kind of education program or public program, and it's not there. So you're, you're out of luck. The other thing that you can do is you can create it yourself in a CAD program. And I started looking around and like, oh yeah, okay. I took, I took uh, AutoCAD in high school, you know, 19 years ago. So uh, I, maybe I could start figuring this stuff out. And so I started looking, there's a couple, there's many different programs out there, right? SketchUp, uh, AutoCAD itself, Fusion 360, uh, SolidWorks. So what I discovered though is I, I found SolidWorks first. And SolidWorks has a roughly $4,000 a year license. And so I said, huh. That's, that's, that's kind of problematic for me. And I started looking at it, and it's actually fairly complicated. So you have to, you know, you would really need to take classes in, uh, in whatever SolidWorks or CAD program that you're gonna do. There are a number of free ones, though. Um, one of my problems was time, right? Like, how much, how much time can I actually devote to learning how to do this on my own? Hour, you know, because then it'll take hours and hours and hours. And that's hours of me on the computer at work when I need to be with, uh, with the public. Right, so it's not it's not always uh, actually going to happen, but there's a there's a lot of capabilities there. And what I what I discovered later on, actually, I I, uh, I talked with Corey about this, and we talked about 3D printing. Uh, Corey is uh, is really you know an engineer now, um, so an engineer by trade. And so I discovered that you there's a lot of capability within CAD programs after you actually scan something, which is. Uh, wait, go back. Hey, the next, the next thing that you can do is you can 3D scan an object. And so that's when I got really excited and I said, we don't need just a 3D printer, we need a 3D scanner too. Why not, right? How can you, you can't have one without the other. Uh, that was my case and so my boss, right, was very, very uh, helpful and she said, okay, well why don't you see if you can find a 3D scanner as well. So I started looking around at 3D scanners and I found one that I really liked and it had a picture of a guy scanning some museum object and I said okay that, that one looks pretty cool. I bet you can do a lot with that and so there's no price on it so it can't be that much right and uh, and so I yeah, yeah this is this is how you figure these things out and so I, I called up and I said 
Uh, I finally tracked somebody down and I said, hey, I'm interested in this particular scanner. And they're like, oh yeah, okay. I was like, how much, how much is that? And he said, 23. I was like, 2300? 23 what? I said, oh, $23,000. I said, oh. And he, he kind of figured out that that's, that's not what I was going. He's like, well, what, what's, your, what's your price range? I said, uh, like $1,000. <laughs> So, so we, he helped me out. He said, okay, mm, okay, let's see, what can I think of? I said, do you just have any recommendations? You know, so he kind of pointed me in the right direction. Here's a couple of, here's a couple of uh, types of scanners that maybe you should be looking for. You know, he said, what are, you, what are you using it for? I said, well, this is, I'm new, in, I'm new in this, right? I just want to get started. I want to figure this out. I want to maybe scan some, some objects and, uh, and get them in and, and 3D print them. Right? That's really what I want to do. I just want proof of concept at this point. And so he said, okay, I think, I think you've got a couple of different options here. And so the one that I, that I actually landed on uh, is, is uh, this one right here. So, oh, look at that. In action, the, the Ein scan. Uh, and so what it, what it actually does, this one, this one is, is kind of interesting. So you, you would place the object that you want to scan right here, and it, it uses, uh, it has three different, different, uh, Windows right here, and it uses light, and it actually you can set it to to rotate. So this this platform will rotate it around and give you a, a three dimensional scan of your object. And so and when it's around a thousand dollars, it's like one thousand to twelve hundred range. Um, so it's it's and and in all honesty, from what I found, like that's kind of a, at the time as low as you're going to get with something that's actually going to going to work, right? And so. And there's Alex's desk right there. Um, and so what I, what I started doing, I said, okay, let's, uh, let's start playing around with this thing. And so my very first, uh, my very first object that I decided to scan was a, a mini ball, right? And so this, was, uh, this is where I, I, I kind of decided, this is, let's see how plug and play this thing is. Let's get this on there. And so I, uh, I didn't, and this is, you know, this is your beginning, so I didn't quite understand some of how it worked and uh, what, what happened. Is that this is it's actually fairly interesting. So when this thing scans, it, it rotates the mini ball around, and this is the initial scan that it picks up. And so the, the blue uh, is the is the exterior uh, of the object. The yellow is the interior of the object, and uh, you can see there's a lot. It's it's pretty pixelated, so it's not actually it's not picking up everything on every scan. And what I didn't realize is that you can keep scanning it. And uh, and it'll it'll pick all that up. I did it twice. This one was a little slow, um, so it's not it's not just a. Uh, I've seen some where actually they have a, a laser essentially, and you can just run them over something, and this beautiful image pops up. This one spins around really slowly, and these really bright like disco lights start shooting out of it, and uh, and I. I was, thought I might have a seizure or needed some sunglasses or something, and then I started looking around. And we, we really we work in a big office, kind of like this, with a with a like a bullpen essentially, and everyone else is staring at me. And so I said, okay, I have to I have to work something out here. We got to make this quick. The first plug and play has got to be quick. And so um, what I what I did is I, I scanned this, kept it simple, uh, and then interestingly enough, the software on the three D scanner. Will uh, will render this up into a three-dimensional object for you, which was, was like, wow, that's pretty amazing. And so what it what it did though is right. This isn't the the perfect uh, mini ball here because you can see it doesn't have that that concave uh, bottom on there. And what I didn't realize at the time is you can actually you can move the object for another scan, and it will if if you uh, if it scans it correctly enough, you it'll it'll match up the different points on the object if they're different enough. And it'll it'll merge them all together, so you can get different angles on that. And I didn't I didn't realize that was the case at first. So what uh, what happened is I had kind of a not perfect mini ball. Um, and what I did is it was actually fairly simple. Uh, the software from the from the three D scanner uh, turned it into a, an STL file, which is what the printer needed to read it. And I simply went onto my computer with the uh, with the printing software open. Double clicked on that thing, and it dropped itself right into my scanning bed. And then, as I was playing around, I realized that you could scale it up and down uh, by moving the mouse when you click a, the scale button. Um, what I didn't know how to do was actually bring it back to the original scale. And <laughs> 
So, that, right, so I still don't know how to do that, actually. Uh, so I, I don't scale things too much. Yeah, we might, we might need some assistance later on with that. Um, so this one's a little slightly larger than, uh, than normal size. And what, uh, what happened? Oh, there she is. So it's not, it's not it's pretty large caliber, right? So, uh, <laughs> and you can see it's not standing up entirely straight there. And, and so it's as, a, as an object that, uh, uh, well, I, I still consider it a success because that was, that was my very first print. Um, so that was proof of concept right there. Like, hey, this thing actually works. I can do this. And it wasn't, it wasn't overly difficult, right? And it didn't take that much time. And so, um, so it, was pretty, it was pretty exciting, really. And that, um, I, was, I was thinking about bringing that and bringing some other uh, objects with me, but then I realized that I, I wasn't actually checking in any bags, and I, I really didn't want to fly out of Boston with a lot of 3D printed gun parts in my carry-on. So, so sorry, no, no actual handouts for you on this one. But that's, uh, that was the very first one. And so to, to, to continue, I, uh, I thought, okay, what else can we, what else can we scan? Right, and so I started uh, getting a little more into it, and so I uh, ended up finding we had for one of our uh, interp ob interpretation objects, we have a 1903, and we have uh, a separate bolt for it. Um, and so I pulled this out and started scanning it. And as you can see, uh, there's some there's some sections that didn't didn't fill in. But what I did is I did the I did the multiple scans, and uh, I mean. You can see the, the face here. It's actually getting some pretty uh, pretty good coverage and some, some pretty in depth uh, like scanning of that. So it was it was it was pretty representative what the object actually looked like. Uh, however, you saw the what I realized pretty soon was that my grand idea of of taking uh, like MGO eights and uh, and Browning machine guns and things like that and put and scanning the whole object. Was was probably not going to happen because my my scanning platform is is that big, so I had to scale down my uh, my grand plans. Uh, but a oh, 1903 bolt fits on there on there nicely, and uh, actually renders as a as a three dimensional object pretty well. And what I discovered pretty early on is uh, is the printer actually. Uh, matched up to my expectations of, of ease of use. There's, you can go as deep as you want into this, and you can get as complicated as you really want to do. But for just working with it s simply, it works pretty well. And one of the problems, though, with 3D printing, when you're printing a very irregularly shaped object, right, is this, this thing is, is working from the bottom up, right? And it's, it's feeding this plastic back and forth. And so your plastic has to, has to have a solid bed and work itself up from that. So when you start getting any kind of angles or things moving off, from side to side, that can be problematic, and you start getting plastic falling down and drooping all over the place, and then your object is not actually what what you were trying to print. And so, what you can, what I found, and what you can do is it'll actually create uh, a, a resting space right there, and that's what this is. And this automatically uh, infills. So when the computer, when the software says, "Okay, we think this is going to fall over," and the the scanner, the printer's not actually going to get to do this, you can just tell it auto infill. And, uh, and, it, and it fills this in. And these actually, uh, this, this plastic builds up, and then you can build the, your bolt handle. And what it does is it actually doesn't, doesn't mold, melt completely into whatever your object is, and easily breaks away. So I've, I've practiced that with some other objects, and it actually works pretty well. So there are some very complicated structures that you can create with this. So that was, that was, uh, that was very fun. I didn't, I didn't print out the, the bolt gun. Uh, We'll, we'll kind of talk about this a little more at the end, bring it up, but there is, uh, there is some, some, some issues, especially today, uh, with, uh, with the concept of like, like ghost guns, right? So non, uh, guns that are not able to be, uh, are not serial numbered, are not uh, uh, able, to, able to go through a metal detector right, undetected, things like that. And so I was trying, this was, this was my initial run into, I convinced, uh, yeah, you know, my, uh, the supervisors that, this is going to be fairly innocuous uh, creations that I was going to do, and so I, I had my proof of concept, but I didn't I didn't quite get into the 1903 bolt just yet. Uh, but I wanted to see if that was something that we could do, and so and it is, and that's what we so we did. So there was some difficulties in this process. Uh, one of them, right, was uh, the learning curve. I had I can turn a, a computer on and off, right, and type type things, and I can I can work in uh, PowerPoint for the most part. 
uh, and, and do other, uh, you know, I'm fairly, fairly confident with that. But when you start getting into uh, using more advanced software, like on a, a 3D printer or a scanner, or really even on, on CAD, right, there's a, there's a learning curve for anyone. It's gonna take you a while to, uh, to, to learn this. And so it's still taking me uh, time to, to figure all this out, be really proficient in it. Uh, the other thing that I discovered was we, I had some problems with school and teacher interest. Right? So how, how actually to use this thing? And so I was getting in touch with uh, technology teachers and, uh, and, and folks that worked with uh, uh, design and, and programming. And I said, hey, I have this, I have this 3D printer. Right? Um, I'd really like to interact with your school and with your students with this. Uh, can, you, can you just get back to me and we can talk about it more? And so I had a lot of folks that just said, I don't really see, a, I don't really see how, to, how to use this. Uh, or mm, I don't I don't really know maybe next next year let's talk next year right so so there was it wasn't a complete brush off but there was, wasn't as much interest as I thought there was going to be which was which was a little disappointing and honestly um, looking back you know some of it is presentation right so some of my difficulties were I was just throwing this idea out at folks and I didn't have a, a defined program that I had created for the actual use of the three D printer with these engineering. Uh, Glasses. So that's that's one thing. The easier I found that you can make it, teachers are very busy folks, and the easier that you can make it for them to uh, to want to interact with you, the better off you are. So that's that's a, we'll talk about that in a minute. But also, this, some of this stuff is time consuming, right? So it's time consuming to learn. It's time consuming to create. Three this this three D printer is slow. There, uh, it's sometimes that that really great looking mini ball that I printed out that took about an hour. To print that out, uh, so it's it's a it's a slow process. So if I wanted to create multiple, right, that's multiple hours of this thing running. Uh, the other the other problem, some of which feeds into that, is space. I realized this thing is actually really big. It's mobile, but it's quite large. And if you and if you look once again, uh, if you look at the the picture to the left of this printer sits my colleague Alex's desk. And the uh, the 3D printer is kind of loud, and it makes some high pitched noises. And there's other folks that uh, are in the office, and so I realized, like, okay, when I'm using this, while it well, it's great because it's mobile. We don't have cable connections all over the building, so when I wanna when I wanna run my computer to this thing, uh, that's one of the places that I have to do it. So I realized, so space can be a can be an issue. So right, so if you're thinking about this. Think about where are you actually? Where is this thing going to live, and where are you going to where are you going to put it? And so that's we're working with uh, IT to to do that right now. Ah, success! So there's there's definitely some some real successes in this uh, that I've had. So the printer, I'm I'm happy. I'm very happy with my choice of printer. It was, it's a very high quality printer. It did all of the things that I wanted it to do. Right? It's a uh, the ability to print objects for education and interpretation programs is there. Uh, we've, we've printed out, as I said, a lock plate. So this uh, is something that we're use, using for uh, a, a program about interchangeability. Right? So there's some that are interchangeable, some that are not, and the kids will be able to actually physically manipulate a uh, flintlock mechanism without actually you know, having a, a metal flintlock mechanism in there. So this thing is easy. I can print out however many of these I want. Uh, I actually got this off of, off of online, right? It was already created, so that was an easy uh, success. And then the other aspect of this is that you don't have to find a, a lock plate, right? Or a, or a whole lock mechanism to actually give to kids to use because they can be very expensive, right? They can be hard to find. It can be hard to find the same one each time. And so with the 3D printer, I can just print these out, and I've got it already right there. Uh, and then there's, there's no worry about um, if it breaks, uh, I can get a new one. There's, a, there's many different kinds of plastic as well. So if you have different, uh, you can actually get springy types of plastic that can act as a, as a spring, and that thing can, can function pretty much like the real mechanism. Uh, the other thing is the tech guy likes it, right? Which is, which is pretty great, because that means I get a lot of tech support with this. So uh, 
our, our overhead is, is pretty enamored with this too. When I'm printing things out, people come and kind of stand around and they want to see what's, what's printing out. So there's a, there's a lot of support within the armory for this, for this program and a lot of people coming up with different ideas. So I, I found that that was, that was very successful as well. Um, so those, those are my successes so far, right? I'm still working on some other things. So the future, right? Was this a failed experiment or not? So that's something that I had to sit down and look at. And I decided that, no, within the time frame that I've had it, I don't think it is a failed experiment. There's, uh, I, have, I will continue to search out school partners. Uh, we have a number of schools that are, that are within our local area, and they're out there. And the more, I, the more I push this and the more I explain to them what we can do, I believe that we can find school partners to really utilize the 3D printer within a program and not just as a, as a thing that prints out objects that I need. Um, we're still going to work with, uh, hopefully, right, work with curatorial staff to create interpretive displays. So I'm not, I'm not curatorial, and so I've been, I, you know, Alex and I have, have discussed this. And that was part of my idea when I, when I got this was hopefully uh, he would be able to use it if he, if he had interest in it. And so, um, so it's there, and we've been, we've been generating ideas, uh, but, uh, but we haven't, in all honesty, come up with a whole lot yet. We've had, uh, we had a some. Some shutdown issues uh, that, that happened and it kind of slowed us down. And then uh, it's been a pretty busy time. There's really only the two of us, so that's a pro that's something that's still still in the works. Um, the other thing I need to do in the future, I need to become competent in, in a CAD program. Uh, talking more with Corey, Corey uh, is is competent in CAD, and he showed me that there's quite a few things you can do with the software in here, where you can th you can scan an object, and it's not a perfect scan, but then you can you can re-render it, you can make it uh, much more much more detailed and, uh, and, and really kind of like exactly representative of the object that you're scanning within a CAD system. So that's something that I'm still I'm learning. I need to continue to become familiar with the printer and scanner software. I feel fairly competent with it right now, but there's always, uh, always more that you can learn. And so that's, that's what I'm doing in the future. And con continue to work on STEAM curriculum, right, utilizing that 3D printer. Uh, because STEAM is very much uh, the way that, uh, that schools are going towards, I feel like, these days. And, and I think that's something that to be relevant within the school system. And not, not just, I, I continue to work with social studies programs, but not just social studies programs. And, and continue to develop larger ones to, to stay up there with other, other teachers and other people going through the, the school uh, program. And I didn't. I didn't turn that to that slide when I said all that. Um, yes, so, <laughs> so that was the future. Uh, cons some considerations. And so this is, this is considerations for myself, considerations for all of us, I feel like, and some of the discussions uh, perhaps we could have right now, if, unless uh, people have others. But um, one of the things that you realize is that, right, so you still have to, if you're going to scan museum objects, you still have to disassemble them. For some places, that's less of a problem than others. But it can be problematic because you have to take apart in very minute detail your your museum objects to actually 3D scan them. Right? And is that is that feasible to do? Is it not? That's something that you have to decide as a as a museum yourself. Um, is it appropriate to share scans of firearms? One of my ideas was that hey, if we can we can scan these things and we can put them into the museum catalog, right? As as three-dimensional scans, uh, and then people can, can dig into these things a little deeper and really get a, a greater understanding of how they work. Um, is, that, is that appropriate to, to do digitally, to share, to share each uh, component of the firearm? I don't know. Um, is it uh, appropriate to utilize firearm designs for educational programming? There's a, uh, and in, in when is it not appropriate? What are the levels of that when you're, when you're working with that? That's something that uh, I wouldn't mind having a discussion on, right? See where people sit. Um, and is, and really you need to look at like for, if you're thinking about 3D printing, right? Is the 3D printer necessary for the educational program? Is it, uh, is it a, a, a nice addition that you don't necessarily need? Or is it something that you can really integrate into there based on all of these thoughts, right? Some of the, the time and the money and uh, all these things that you're spending. On this uh, on this object, right? Is it is it worth doing? Um, I'm happy. I think I think mine was. I'm not dissatisfied with what we have, 
and I think there's there's a lot of benefits it'll give to the museum in the future. Uh, that's just something that's ongoing. The other thing, and also interesting um, that Ashley mentioned this at the beginning, but uh, when, if you if you do build a firearm, right, three dimensionally uh, with a three D printer, uh, what are the legalities of that, right? So if you build uh, Browning 1919, and it's all maybe doesn't have a metal barrel or metal components, but is that a is that a firearm? Is it not? For different countries, different states, right? There's uh, there's many uh, jurisdictions out there that have different firearms laws, and, <laughs> as an understatement. And so you need to think is you need to really do the research on this and say like is this is this something that we can even do? Right? That's another consideration. And so with that, I'd like to thank everybody for for uh, listening, and then open it up to questions or comments that you might have.